I just wanted to kind of look at from you know science fiction, but also science, because actual scientists have often made claims about these things. Um, talk about uh, what these visions of uh, the far future um, and what intelligence or uh, rationality or you know moral agency, however you want to put it, might eventually achieve. Uh, and the emphasis is on might, and I guess in some of the stories that I'm going to try and weave together. Um, I think one of the things uh, that I want to stress throughout is that you know there's been there's you know a, a trans historical tradition of people being utopianists of you know various stripes, um, but a lot of those you know that tradition uh, I don't think we're going to cover here or um, we're going to try and zoom in on something more specific because a lot of those people would make the claim that that utopian they imagined is going to happen uh, regardless of what we do. It's the kind of end point of history if you want to be Hegelian about it or, um, you know, in kind of the platonic uh, utopia, he kind of said that uh, it would exist some, somewhere else in, in space or time inevitably because space and time are so large. So I want to kind of explore visions of what could be achieved that are a based in some kind of uh, actual scientific um, claims, uh, you know, and obviously because that's revisable, we're going to look at some um, claims that are now wrong, uh, but, you know, within that, the framework of the time, uh, and B, claims by people about what could be achieved that are also sensitive uh, to historical contingency. And more importantly, um, I guess the fact that everything can go wrong. Um, so one of the themes that I want to talk with you guys about is um, what I'm trying to call, uh, you know, the high stakes worldview. I think it's an aspect of modernity uh, as like a historical category, um, which recognizes that uh, the future is not going to be business as usual. Um, it's either going to be um, potentially um, much worse or much better, um, but it's not necessarily going to stay steady or the same. Um, now you see this in lots of different strands of thought, uh, but this idea that, um, you know, uh, say humanity goes extinct or messes up the whole biosphere, that's a radically worse future. Uh, but then there are these potentials that we're going to explore in this course of people imagining uh, these kind of big wins. So say uh, life is spread elsewhere, um, there is more uh, vibrance and uh, value in the universe than there otherwise is now. And, you know, these, pe these people we're going to be talking about have made the claim that, you know, it's, a, it's based upon uh, what humanity does next that will build the, be the building blocks before these kind of grand futures to happen. So I, I think that that's, that's, that's my belief is that um, things aren't, are not going to get better, but they could. And so, you know, insofar as there are intelligent beings in this biosphere, maybe in this, you know, kind of galaxy, maybe further beyond, who knows, we don't, that's an open question. Insofar as there are intelligent in the sense that we are discursive, rational, etc., you know, um, imbued with some sense of right and wrong, uh, I think that there's that possibility of correcting uh, previous error. You know, that's the thing that um, that's the thing that we humans tend to do uh, quite uniquely. I would argue. Um, you know, obviously there are myriad other intelligences, um, and you know, the direction of travel is constantly kind of uh, you know going you know humanity losing its uniqueness and its uniqueness cognitively in lots of domains but nonetheless this ability to correct past error um in some meaningful way i think that that's that is something that is you know something that we can do so i think i think that yeah as long as there are people around persons around there is the potential for things to get better what is the good i would instantly say we don't know uh we don't know yet, uh, and it will continue being an open question, you know, potentially for uh, indefinitely. But um, like we have some 
we have on the table now various different ideas of what is the good and um one of them is to not impose your good on other people uh to basically uh underwrite conditions in which uh there's as much like plurality and kind of um i guess i i mean obviously the word has been trashed but liberty to for di into, like your different people to pursue that i think that's an important thing to preserve is the ability for people to even decide what's good right that's kind of i guess what we were talking about earlier is that um zenobio's point i think he made where it's like it's people have to be around for that process to even happen now you make the other interesting claim is that you know is what's good good for humans now um i would say no but there is an important, um, you know, animal suffering matters, right? I, I think, I think that, that, you know, I think that that's the case. Um, so there's a distinction that some uh, philosophers make that I am, I think is quite persuasive is that uh, there are moral agents and then moral patients. Uh, so um, a lot of animals, um, some animals might be moral agents, uh, right? But like most of them probably, you know, kind of, um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't think that a factory farm chicken is a moral agent, it, but it nonetheless it is a moral patient, right? So it's like good matters. So the, what it, you know what it's going through matters, and so I think that their lot should also be improved. But that doesn't mean that they're agents in the sense that you know if there were no moral agents around, there wouldn't be any kind of motive force uh, to basically uplift or improve the lot of those patients that are around. So I guess that's. That's one of the ways that I would answer the kind of is what's good, good for humans question. Um, I'm not sure if it's a very persuasive or a good answer, but it's just what I have right now.